So now that we've seen what the definition of a group is in abstract algebra, that it consists of a set of elements, think of them as the nouns, and a binary operation, think of it like the verb in this system, and that operation must be associative, it must have the closure property, it must have the identity property, and it must have the inverses property. Now that we're familiar with that definition, the question is, in what sense does this very simple structure permit us to do algebra in the sense that we would recognize doing algebra? So in this video, we're going to review a few preliminary results that we can prove about how groups work and how we can do algebra inside of groups. And all we need in order to prove these things is the very simple structure that we get from the definition of a group. So what do associativity, identity, and inverses actually get us? How can we still do algebra? The first property is the property of the uniqueness of the identity element. So if E is an identity element in my group, and E prime is also an identity element in my group, then we'll be able to show that E prime must be the same thing as E. In other words, there cannot be more than one different identity element inside of any given group. How do we prove that? Well, let's suppose that E prime is an identity element for our group. And then we, let's just form the product, E prime multiplied by E. What can we say about that? Well, on the one hand, because E prime is an identity element, it doesn't change anything that it multiplies. So E prime multiplied by E is going to just be E, because E prime is an identity. But on the other hand, E is also an identity element. And so when E multiplies E prime, it doesn't change E prime either. And so this same expression, E prime multiplied by E, is on the one hand equal to E prime, and on the other hand is equal to E. So by the transitive property of equality, we conclude E prime is equal to E. Therefore, no group can have more than one different identity element. And we know every group has one because that's one of the assumptions that goes into the definition of a group. So every group has a unique identity element. Okay, so what about algebra? One of the most fundamental things we need to be able to do if we're going to do algebra is to solve equations. So can we solve equations inside of group land? So here's an equation. A times B equals A times C, where A, B, and C are elements of the group. And by times, I really mean the operation which defines this group. So the question is, can I simplify this equation by operating on both sides? That's the kind of thing we want to do if we're going to say we're doing algebra. And it turns out that the answer is yes. Notice that what I have in common on both sides of this equation is that on the left side of each expression, I've got an A. Can I get rid of those A's by dividing on both sides somehow? Can I conclude that if AB is equal to AC, then B must be equal to C just by canceling the A's? We call this left cancellation. I'm canceling a common factor of A on the left side of both expressions in my equation. And this is true inside of our group structure. Let's see why. So let's suppose that AB is equal to AC. Then all we really want to do is take the inverse of A. And the inverse of A exists because our group has the inverses property. Every group has the inverses property. So we can take the inverse of A and multiply both the expression on the left side and the expression on the right side by the inverse of A. We know we can do that because that inverse exists and because of the transitive property of equality. Well, OK. Um, but we can't simplify these expressions yet because of the parentheses that are sitting here. If we can move those parentheses so that instead of being around the A and the B, they're around the A inverses and the A's, then we'll be in better shape. We can do that because the operation in a group is associative. And the associative property says, I can move this pair of parentheses wherever I need it. And I don't change the value, don't change the element that that product of three things represents. And since I've now moved the parentheses to be around the A inverse and the A, we can ask ourselves, what do we get when we do A inverse operation A? And that again is the inverses property for groups that we know is a thing for every group. That's equal to the identity element E, or an identity element E, but now we know it's the identity element E. And then what we're left with is E times B and E times C. And by the identity property that exists in every group, 
an identity element doesn't change the thing that it operates on. So EB is equal to B, EC is equal to C, and we have therefore deduced that B must have been equal to C, proving the left cancellation property. So this means if I have a common factor on the left side of both expressions in my equation, I can cancel those common factors and therefore make my equation simpler. And as you might expect, there was nothing special about the left side of these expressions. If I had had a common factor on the right side of both, BA is equal to CA, I could also have canceled those A's on the right using the process called right cancellation. And the proof is completely analogous. All we have to do at our first step is instead of um, operating by the inverse of A on the left side of both expressions, this time we'll operate by the inverse of A on the right side of both expressions. And the rest of the argument is completely the same, using the associative property to move the parentheses, using the inverse property to simplify the product of A with its inverse, using the identity property to simplify the product of B and C with that identity, and therefore B is equal to C. So this is great. Properties 2 and 3 are probably the most fundamental and important. They really tell us we can do algebra with a group, because anytime we have those common factors on both sides of an equation, we can simplify by canceling them out. Okay, so the next property tells us that not only is the identity element in a group unique, but also that every element in the group can't have more than one different inverse either. Right? So we know every element has an inverse, that's the inverse's property that is part of the definition of the group, but this property tells us that an element can't have more than one different inverse, that inverses are unique. And as with every uniqueness proof, we begin by making the supposition that we have two inverses. So let's suppose that I pick an element A and that you hand me two elements B and C and you tell me both of those are inverses for A. What we'd like to show is that then B and C have to be the same as one another. That would be how a uniqueness proof concludes. So how do we prove that? Well, if B is an inverse for A, then that must mean that B operated on A gives me the identity. If C is also an inverse for A, then that means C operate A gives me an identity element, right? That's the inverse's property in our group. Now, these two E's that I wrote down on the right side of these equations, they have to be the same as one another because we only have one identity element in any group. That's the uniqueness of identity. And therefore, if BA is equal to E and CA is equal to E, then by the transitive property of equality, that must mean that BA is equal to CA, because both of those things are in turn equal to the same thing, namely the unique identity element E. And now that BA is seen to be equal to CA, we can apply, it turns out to be right cancellation, to cancel that common factor of A on the right side of both expressions and conclude that B is equal to C. So every element in a group not only has an inverse, but the inverse that that element has is unique. So, for example, in the group of integers, with the operation being addition, the element 5 has an inverse, negative 5. It's the inverse because when you take 5, apply the operation of addition, and add minus 5 to it, the result, 0, is the identity element in that group. And there's no other number in that whole system that gives us the identity when we add it to 5. 5 and negative 5 are, are a pair. And there's no other inverse that either one of them has but one another. So inverses are unique. It's kind of this nice little monogamous relationship uh, that every element in a group has with its inverse. Finally, while we're on the topic of inverses, how do inverses behave with respect to the operation in a group? And what I'm really asking is if I have two elements A and B and I form their product, if I operate A operation B, if I want the inverse of that product, how do I understand that inverse in terms of the inverses of A and B themselves? And this is a great property that some authors call the socks and shoes property. The idea being that when I put my shoes and socks on, I put my socks on first, then I put on my shoes. So socks first and then shoes. But when I take them off, I have to take off my shoes first and then take off my socks. Right? I have to, they have to take them off in the reverse order that we put them on. And so this, in this formula, the inverse of A operation B is B inverse first operated A inverse second. So if I put on my socks and then my shoes, 
If I want to undo that, I'll take off my shoes and then take off my socks. To prove that, all we have to do is verify that if I have any elements A and B in my group, if I take this supposed inverse for AB and I operate by that inverse on one side of AB, I'm going to choose the left side, but the proof is analogous for the right, all we have to do is simplify this expression, and we hope that this expression simplifies out to the identity, because then that would show that this blue element here, B inverse A inverse, is indeed the inverse of the red element, AB. How do we simplify this? Well, we've got too many parentheses for my taste, so let's use the associative property that exists in every group operation to move the parentheses around to where is convenient for us. And it's convenient for us to put them around the A inverse operate A. Because we can, looking ahead with a little algebraic foresight, realize that A inverse operate A is going to simplify to E, the identity, again by the inverses property that every group enjoys. And then we can take, again applying the associative property, we can group this E with either the B inverse ahead of it or the B after it. Let's say we pick the B after it. Okay, so there's a secret associative property application. And when I take E operation B, the result is B. That's the identity property. E operated by anything on either side doesn't change that thing. And now with one more application of the inverses property, B inverse operate B gives me the identity. And therefore, this blue element, B inverse A inverse, is indeed the inverse of the product AB. Because when I operate on the left side of AB with that element, the result gives me the identity. So this set of five properties really gives us some reassurance that if we have the structure of a group, even as sparse as that structure is, associativity, closure, identity property, inverse property, just having those four things, no matter what kinds of elements, what kind of animals are in my farm, what kind of nouns are in my dictionary, and no matter what kind of a verb I'm using to, to make an operation on those elements, as long as it satisfies those four basic properties, we can do an awful lot of what looks like algebra.